y'all. I'm your host, Kelly Nagel. In the second part of our conversation with former NBA player and social justice advocate, Mahmoud abdul Rauf joins the research cohort for spirited, insightful, and a heartfelt conversation on what it takes to affect meaningful change in society. The dialogue left our research cohort inspired and armed to make progress in their quest for social change. Enjoy. Thank you again for having me. Uh, this is a huge topic, uh, one that, like so many others, that I'm, I'm super passionate about. I never try to use my words loosely. I'm really passionate. My mind is all over the place. I may be like literally all over the place with this because there's so much, so much to cover. Actually, last night, because I was looking at the, the, the email and you talked about change and I was jotting down some notes and I'm not big on necessarily reading, reading notes. I like to just, just come with it, but this is what I was jotting down in my head with the question, what does it mean to want change, right? And I said, it means you haven't bought into the laissez-faire, individualistic, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps narrative, where your life and thoughts are limited to you. It means you're not that naive to think you achieve whatever you have on your own in the absence of your environment and people you constantly cross paths with that in ways you don't always recognize benefit you. It means you have placed a high premium on something bigger than yourself. It means you have embraced the saying, the goal in life is to find your gift and the purpose in life is to give it away. It means you understand the wise words that if you change, uh, if you want change, you need to lose yourself in the service of others. It means also you understand the concept of Ubuntu, where this anthropologist put fruit in a basket and he took it uh, at a distance near a tree and he asked those that were that were in his presence, if any one of you could reach this tree first, could have all the fruits for themselves. And he anticipated that there was going to be some selfishness, some greed involved. They were going to rush to the tree. An individual was going to get it and wasn't going to share it. Instead, they looked at each other. They grabbed hands. They ran to the tree together. And when they got there, he was perplexed. He said, why did you do that? They said, Ubuntu. They said, how can one be happy when the rest of us are sad? And they went on to say that this is a psychology among African tribes that I am because we are. It means you want to be the change you want to see in people. It means you acknowledge that important idea. If one member of the body is in pain, the rest feels it. It means you want for humanity what you want for yourself. It means you have realized the necessity of sacrifice, compassion, unity, risk, and reach one of the highest stations of love. We don't talk about that enough. The ethics of love in terms of instituting and bringing about change. Because love is not silent in the face of struggle. It's as someone once said, when you love, let it be known. Because also justice is what love looks like in public. So what does it mean, all of that and then some? And you have in the words of Huey P. Newton, speaking on the difference between reactionary suicide and revolutionary suicide. He said, it's not that, and that's giving your life for something. He said, it's not that we have a death wish. He said, it's quite the opposite. It means that we have such a strong desire to live with peace and dignity that the existence without it is impossible. It means you don't see yourself as an individual only, but a part of the entire human and earthly constellations. So I was thinking about that, you know, when I was thinking about change. And I was also thinking about, um, because I know we're also dealing with the aspect of sports. And I remember something that Bruce Lee had, had said to his protege, And he was trying to convince him, look, let's go and run uh, two miles. And his protege didn't want to run. And he kept at him. He kept at him. Eventually, he agreed. In the midst of running within about maybe a quarter of a mile, the guy's huffing and puffing. Bruce says casually, let's do five miles. The guy says, man, (laughs) I can't, Bruce. I'm going to die. Bruce so nonchalant said, well, die then. And kept running. But it ticked the dude off. In his anger, the dude kept running, but he finished the five miles. When it was all said and done, people around him said, Bruce, why were you so callous? Why were you so hard on him? He said, because once you give up on yourself, there are carryovers in life. You start giving up on your business. You start giving up on your family. You start giving up on everything else. So never give up. There's a saying by Jasper Pure that To be calm, what must we forget to inhabit such a restful feeling? 
right? I could never at that age even, even though you're playing basketball, you're getting recognized, there was always something in me because of the conditions that I was living in. As I said, there are carryovers to everything, right? And the environment that you live in, the information that you're receiving, good and bad, has a way of molding and shaping you. And so when I look back, I'm like, wow, these things really, this is no surprise that I'm this way. This is not a surprise that I didn't stand for the flag. It's not a surprise that I spoke out against 9-11 on HBO that beheaded my career. Because of all of the things that I grew up seeing, even the images on television that we see about, we're constantly seeing good times. And I don't know if you know about this. I know you're young. There was a series called Good Times and there was a series called Sanford and Son. Every single episode, we're poor. So we're waiting. It seems like they're about to get out the ghetto. And every time it seems they're about to get out the ghetto, something happens to put them right back in the ghetto. And it's like you're hype and then you're crushed. You get hype and you're crushed. And this is year in and year out. I get to LSU, I'm breaking records. I'm doing things that at that point, no freshman other than Pete Maravich has done. But after a 53 point game, I'm on the bus crying. Not because I'm happy, I'm crying because I'm sad, I'm scared. This should be the happiest moment in my life. I'm as close to the NBA as I've ever been. But now I'm on the bus and I'm literally looking out the window and I'm crying. People might think it's happy. I'm like terrified. I'm like, something is going to happen to me. The plane is going to crash. This is too good to be true. Why did I think that? It's because the images and the messages that society is constantly telling you about who you are, what your potential is, what you can do, what you can't do. And so those images were telling me year in and year out that no matter what you do, no matter how great you are, just like Sanford and Son, just like uh, Good Times, you are always anticipating something happening in your life that was gonna prevent you from getting over the hump. And so it's saying, no matter how great you are, you're gonna always end up in the ghetto. And so for me, that's why I thought that way. I couldn't, I couldn't really embrace success the way other people could embrace it. I really couldn't, you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable. I was always anticipating something happening. Now there's beauty in that as well because it keeps you humble and it keeps you hungry because you don't want to go back to that state because you know what it feels like. So you work harder. But I started to analyze my life in that way. And I'm thinking, I'm like, mama, what, what brought you here? So I'm saying that to say too, that there's myriad like ways. And, and I know you guys get it. You're honest students and congratulations for you getting to this point. I wish I could have been an honest student, you know, back then. It's a beautiful thing. But there are so many ways to bring about change. I mean, when you read history, when you look at the Ida B. Wells, when you look at the uh, 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 David Walkers, the Frederick Douglasses, the, I mean, the host, the Audrey Lords, the Nat Turners, the Denmark Vesey's, the ones that people don't want you to talk about because they don't fit into the official paradigm of how change should come about, right? The dominant authorities say, look, Call your congressman, write to them, vote, have a candlelight vigil, have a, 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 a protest that's peaceful. But history shows us that there were so many other ways, whether we agree or don't agree, to bring about change. And we have to begin to, I think, re, uh, reimagine what change looked like outside of the official paradigm. What how we talked about this earlier, what happened in Minnesota during the police brutality, George Floyd killing. What the people in Minnesota were able to do in changing the way the police and the precinct, precinct did its job, legislation hadn't did in a hundred years because they didn't follow the script, right? And so we have to begin to reimagine things like power. What does that mean? Reimagine where power comes in. You know, we hear, oh, power corrupts, right? A lot of things can corrupt, but we have to reimagine power. We have to analyze emotions and change. We have to analyze action and change. 
there's so many things we have to begin to reimagine. You know, even when I look and I study the history, because we can pull from everybody. You know, I was thinking about what even Martin Luther King talked about, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There's a saying in my belief that when one member of the body is in pain, the rest is affected by it. There's this concept called chaos math, right, or the butterfly effect. When a butterfly flaps its wings on one side of the earth, it can create a tsunami on the other side of the earth. So we're all interrelated in some way. What, 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 what's happening in, 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 in Palestine and what's happening in Chechnya and what's happening in America, everything, even though we may not feel the immediate results of it, right, we're being impacted by it. Just like that, that butterfly effect, just like that chaos math theory that from what I was told hasn't been disproved yet, that if a butterfly flaps its wing on one side, it can produce a tsunami on the other. And so, you know, you were talking earlier about, do you realize that you've had an impact on change, right? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you do when you hear the, the fact that you hear people talking about it. There's, a, there's an impact but how much of an impact we won't really know. And sometimes in the process of changing something, you change. Like the thoughts you had initially may evolve to become something even bigger. Martin Luther King, for example, in the end of his life, he wasn't the same Martin Luther King that he started off as, and a lot of leaders weren't. He mentioned to Belafonte in one of his meetings, he said, listen, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, I think I've messed up. I think I've integrated my people into an already burning house. He began to think differently on how the world was. He said the biggest purveyor of, a, of violence in the world is American imperialism. These were things that he didn't see or didn't communicate and articulate before. So sometimes where you start off is not where you end. And sometimes the things that you do may not be felt in your lifetime, but other people, just like the seeds you plant, they may reap the benefits of what you what you what what you laid and what you what you planted. It's a great book. This is the this is the book, Civilized to Death: The Price of Progress, by Christopher Ryan's. Please, he has a podcast. Please get it. But he says here in 2011, Apple's Tom Cook was paid 378 million in salary, stock, and other benefits, 6,258 times the wage of the average employee at Apple. The richest 85 people in the world control more wealth than the poorest half of the planet's population. Let that sink in for a moment. 85 human beings who fart in bed, just like you and me, control more wealth than 3.5 billion other people, many of whom live in desperate poverty. Piketty, who is arguably the world's leading expert on income and wealth inequality, according to Nobel laureate Paul Krugman, has concluded that income inequality in the United States today is probably higher than in any other society at any time in the past, anywhere in the world. Such disparities of wealth are not just inhumane, they are inhuman, offending our innate predisposition for fairness. And I'm gonna end with this one. He talks about, in this book, he's talking about hunter gatherers, he's talking about dentistry, because we think, well, Sometimes there's this notion that just because time evolves, it automatically leads to progress. Not necessarily so. He, he pulls up uh, uh, some people in Sudan, like dating, I can't forget how many years ago. And they study their gums and everything. And their, their gums and their teeth. And we say, well, we have fluoride. We have this, we have that. They were stronger. They were stronger by far consistently than ours. They talked about, and I don't want to gross you out, pregnancies, childbirth. We, we live in an age where you have C-sections. You have all of those things. And he talks about how vaginal juices from a woman is linked to a child's uh, immune system and their, men, their, their brain activity and their character. But when you take, when you cut open a woman's stomach for a C-section, they're getting a lot of microbes that haven't been evolved over millions of years. They're getting them off the, 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 the doctor's hand, doctor, the curtains, and they affect the child's ability. But we think what? That because we the time evolves and because you got now medicine, 
right? You got this, that, oh, it leads to progress, not necessarily so. And throughout the book, he's constantly dealing with uh, uh, subject after subject. He says, when agriculture came, all of these other things began to emerge and society began to crumble and chaos began. To, he linked so many things. But in this, I'm going to say this, and this is dealing with kind of radicalism, right? And we've lost our way because we fall into this official way of doing things. And we don't want to think outside the box. We don't want to challenge power. No, because I'm, I'm afraid I might lose my job. I'm afraid my mom and my, you're going to, there's going to be losses when you do this type of thing. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose position. You know, you, you're going to, and I'm not saying every person has to be on the forefront. There are people that can give money. There are people that can write. There's so many ways. There's a saying in our belief system that if you see a, a, if you see a wrong and injustice, change it with your hands. If you can't do that, change it, speaking out about it or writing about it. And if you can't do that, feel it in your heart, but know that that's the weakest of faith. Here in his book, he says, when three Tupanamba natives were taken, into, taken, to, taken to France from Brazil in the sixth century, the essayist Montaigne, I think that's his name, was present at their visit with King Charles IX. When the natives were asked what they found most peculiar about the European way of life, Montaigne recounts, quote, they had observed that there were among us men full and crammed with all manner of commodities, while in the meantime, others were begging at their doors, lean and half starved with hunger and poverty. And they thought it strange that these necessitous people were able to suffer so great an inequality and injustice, and that they did not take the others by the throats or set their fi houses on fire. We have learned to suffer <laughs> quietly. We have learned to be silent in the face of suffering. Aaron Dottie Roy said something that I use almost every time I talk, because every time I think about it, man, it hits the mark for me. Once she says, once you see something, you can't unsee it. To be silent, to say nothing, is just as political an act as speaking out. Either way, you're accountable. That's super powerful and super true. And when we get to that level, right, like everything else, it gets comfortable. You know, we have to train ourselves. They said, if you want to, they've done studies. If you want to lose weight, hang and you're overweight, hang around somebody that's in shape. If you're not smart, hang around a smart person. So if you want to be moral, hang around a person that's more. If you want to be an activist, hang around activists. Why? Because there's a lifestyle that's associated with that. There's a language that's associated with that. And the more you're around these types of people, it rubs off. You get some of that. So whatever work you're trying to do, if that's if I'm trying to be an NBA basketball player and you're trying to be a botanist, <laughs> I'm not saying we can't we can't coexist. We can't have dialogue. But if you hanging with me, I'm spending so much time on the court. You're not going to be great as a botanist. I'd like to thank Mahmoud for joining me today. If you'd like to see what he's up to, you can follow him on Instagram at MahmoodAR123. I'd also like to thank all those who made this podcast possible. Our wonderful production team, the George Milton Group, Winnie the Moog, and my team, Think Tank Project co-founder, Matthew DeSantis. Most importantly, I'd like to thank you, the listener. Let us know you're listening. Subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And follow the podcast at problem underscore pod. For more information on today's topic or to find out more about social justice programming for exceptional teens, please follow the Teen Think Tank Project at team underscore think tank. Until next week, I'm Kelly Nagel.